My name is Jenny Kleins, and I run um, Opus Press here at Politics and Prose. I'd like to thank everyone for coming to the store this evening as we welcome Alexandra Horowitz to discuss her latest book, recently out in paperback, On Looking. As many of you know, Alexandra is currently a professor of psychology, animal behavior, and canine co cognition at Barnard College at Columbia University. In her latest book, Alexandra talks to us about opening our eyes. Taking 11 walks with 11 experts, she describes with sincerity and humor how people peer into the world around them, how their observations are the same or different, and how the topics we choose to observe or ignore relate to the variety of human experience. Overall, it is a book that teaches us about looking at the mundane spectacles that are all around us. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Alexandra Horowitz. Thanks, Jenny. That's awfully nice. You know, I was, I was, um, it's so nice to be here. You know, I was at the um, American Psychological Association conference earlier today, which is at your convention center. Um, can you hear me well here? Is this good? No, not back there. How about this? Okay. Uh, and this is so much nicer. This is just a few. <laughs> um, at any rate, I was supposed to come a year and a half ago when the book came out in, in hardback, and I, and I got the norovirus. Do you remember the norovirus season? That I got that. And so it's so nice to be asked back. Thank you very much. Um, so to, well, first I wanted to draw your attention to something, um, which is the things you're missing right now. You're all adults. I don't see anybody under five. So your expert concentrators. Oh, is there one? <laughs> so she's, that's, she'll be a good contrast class. Um, <laughs> You're good at concentrating, so you're not hearing the hum of the lights. And you're not really hearing the other ambient sounds of the room. And you know, don't smell the glue of the book machine. And you're probably not noticing the places that the chair is pressing up against your back or legs, or the warm or cool spots on your body where your legs are crossed and it's warm between your legs, but your elbows are cool. or the tongue that you're holding to the roof of your mouth right now, or the tension in your shoulders. You're probably not noticing these things. And I got very interested in the fact <coughs> that the, ver the great majority of sensory experience we're having right now, or at any instant, we are not noticing. You know, that we've become very good, and this is sort of being a professional human, at ignoring most things. And I wanted in this book to start looking again, looking more closely, not at any particular thing, but just almost looking at the practice of looking at the things that are there for the seeing. If you just bother to open your eyes or start to smell or notice something that's you've seen a million times but never looked at. Um, and it's also a little bit of a book about a city. I, it's mostly about New York, but it's about really any city. It's not about a particular place. And it's a book about walking and the power of walking to incite observation. Um, you might know me um, uh, from my previous book, or you might know that I study dog cognition. If you don't, that's what I do professionally. I actually study dog minds and what dogs think. And I wrote a book about this a number of years ago. And in some sense, I feel like this is the same concept, actually just um, rendered with people as opposed to just dogs. Because what drew me to write inside of a dog and to study dogs was the very fact that they're so familiar. They're so well known to us that we almost don't look at them at all. You know? And um, this is what happened to me. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into this. I'll do a little reading. I tend to think that author's reading is not like the most exciting part of a reading, actually. So I won't do that much of that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions. But let me tell you about how I got into this, um, or how I got into dogs, which really started it off. Uh, I was in graduate school studying animal behavior and very interested in animal cognition, what behaviors we could see animals do that would allow us to infer something about their minds. Because we can't just ask them and expect them to give us intelligible answers. Um, and I got 
keen on play behavior as something that might be really insightful about what animals knew about one another. Because in human development, psychologists are very keen on the importance of play behavior in a child's developing an understanding of themselves versus others, having a perspective, learning about pretend and reality. And I thought, I'm really interested in whether non-human animals have all those things. Non-human animals play. Almost, I think all mammals play, and many non-mammalian forms play. So is that play something in which we could see some rudimentary or inceptive understanding of others' perspectives? So I go on a hunt for animals who might be playing a lot. And um, I was in cognitive science department, and you sort of you look at primates first because we're the most interesting, right? And um, there are there is a lot of pl playing in, in monkey species and in, in the great apes, but they don't play all the time. You know, it's difficult. In in, in the wild animal park I was in in Escondido, California, you know, they if they want to play, they can maybe go out of view, and you don't see them playing. And I was more interested in getting a lot of data from a lot of behavior. So while I, this was happening and I was searching for a playing animal, I had a dog, Pumpernickel, and I'm you know, taking her out a couple of times a day um, to the beach or to a dog park, and she's playing. And because I was a graduate student and you're extremely narrow-minded, like this is the most narrow-minded provincial time of your life, that's where you're sort of professionally becoming narrow-minded, I didn't see for maybe a year that this species played a lot and that I should study dogs. So then I proposed this to my committee and um, everybody hated the idea because nobody was studying dogs at the time as cognitive creatures, as creatures of cognitive interest. And I've tried to deconstruct why this might be. Um, this was in the late 90s. I think it was that people were interested in exotic animals. I mean, first, we're interested in animals who are closest, most closely related to us, but also exotic animals. And dogs are right there. They're so well known. They're so familiar. How could we not know? I mean, of course, we have a huge vocabulary to describe our dog's thoughts as soon as we get a dog, right? We say we don't know a lot about the dog, but we still fill their lives with our imaginations about what they know and understand. And so people weren't thinking of studying them. Um, at around that time, a few people started to think of studying them, and now there is a real veritable field of dog cognition research, which I'm happy to be a part. Um, even before I had that minor epiphany as a graduate student that the thing right in front of me was interesting, I know that my dog had started to change my perception a little bit. I mean, I, I've lived with dogs now for 20 some years and I've been taking a couple walks a day with dogs and at some point, you know, 15,000 walks in, I think I realized that I'd been infected with my dog's view of the block. In other words, if I was walking down a city street and there was no lamppost and no tree and no fire hydrant, I thought, well, this is a lousy block. Why would anybody walk down the street? Because I knew it wasn't interesting to my dog. But I wasn't even ruminating on it that much. But essentially, now I'm all about ruminating about that. I want to know what my dog's experience is. And along the way, I thought, well, if my dog can show me this much about how much I'm missing on the block, that for her, the block is all about smells present and past, that she might be perceiving people who've gone by long, bef long ago, or weather that's coming from New Jersey, or um, you know, the, the, the pattern of somebody who was injured, or what they ate as they walked down the street, then what could other people who can actually tell me what they see, what could they show me on the block? So for this book, I, t I began a project where I took dozens of walks with people, most of whom I didn't know. I just called them up and said, hey, will you go for a walk around the block with me and just show me what you see? And to my great surprise, many people said yes. I understand the people who did not return my call. But <laughs> it was a very unusual request. And I actually am really thankful and, and kind of bowled over that anybody would do that because it's a strange thing to do, to go walk with a stranger and just talk about what you see. These were not expert walkers, right? They weren't people who do this for a living. They were just people, there was a geologist, 
you know, I'd written some, I'd read some things he'd written, Sid, Sid Horenstein at the Museum of Natural History. He was an interesting writer. I thought he'd be great to just walk around the block with. Um, and an, a guy who, a naturalist named Charlie Eisman up in Massachusetts who tracks insect sign. In other words, the, the track of insects. He's not really looking for the insects. He's looking for the things they've left behind, the web or the, the, the footprints or um, the injury to a leaf. You know, and I thought, well, he'd be interesting. You know, I call him up, and he, sure, he walked around the block with me, and that was wonderful. And so in every one of these walks, in asking them to just show me what they saw, I got some zeroing in on one aspect of the environment. And it was inevitably surprising. It was inevitably something I hadn't seen. And I thought it was a pretty decent observer. I mean, I was professionally trained as an observer of animals. But most of what people could show me, I hadn't seen before. And so this book is kind of about that exploration. Of course, I also got the idea of walking around the block <laughs> from my dog, right? Because that's the route that you go. Um, it's the most ordinary thing, where there's certainly nothing new to see. And so the exercise for myself was to see if there was something new to see. Um, and there always was. Um, I did walk with people who had some expertise. So the geologist you know, really know, knew about geology. Now, I thought he might not have anything to show me because I was going to walk with a city in him and it's not full of geology, right? But of course, I was completely wrong there, right? The city. He views the world as minerals or biomass. So you're, you're living or you're stone. <laughs> and so in the city, you know, there's a lot of living, but there's a lot of stone. And not only that, but the stones are all individuated to him. And that doesn't just mean like the boulders you see. That means the face of the building, the steps of the building, the concrete, the asphalt, the lining of the concrete, the banister next to the building, the places the building was repaired. Those are all stones with distinctive identities. They're from different places. They're from different times. And actually, immediately, the block looks like a cacophony because it's this mashup of things from different locations and different times. Indiana limestone from 350 million years ago next to Vermont bluestone. You think, it's crazy. Why do we do that? That's how he saw the block. Um, I walked with a doctor who I... Um, who was very interested in the kind of the physicalness of a physical exam. And I got interested in walking with a doctor pretty much because of Sherlock Holmes. Um, because Doyle, Conan Doyle, was influenced by his medical professor, Dr. Bell, who had a seemingly miraculous ability to tell someone's profession um, before examining them and finding out anything about them, just by looking at them, you know, seeing the inside wear on a man's pants and realizing that he must be a cobbler because that's where cobblers hold their lapstone that gets and it, that is rubbed. Um, and and Arthur Conan Doyle was so interested in how you could detective someone's history from just their appearance that he kind of gave that attribute to Sherlock Holmes. And so I wanted to back up and say, well, are there doctors who are still doing that, who are looking at you? I mean, cer certainly you've probably been in a medical exam where they say, well, walk across the room. You know, you think, well, I don't walk, you know. But you, your walk is, is a huge diagnostic tool. It tells you your stride, your gait, your asymmetries, your posture, your bearing, tells somebody who's trained to look that way a lot about your health and your history and your age. And so I walked with a doctor and we just l looked at everybody coming toward us as though you know, they were presenting themselves for diagnosis, which was terrifying. You know? <laughs> so th but these types of people had an expertise, but not everybody had to have an expertise to be able to lend some insight. I walked with my toddler son. I mean, I'm biased, but a toddler has an incredible uh, any toddler has an incredible perceptual ability, which we no longer have, which is the inability to think that things are unlovely, <laughs> right? Like they sort of do not di differentiate. They're trying to understand the differentiations we make. This is culture and schooling and sort of a shame because <laughs> for the child, everything is interesting. And I walked with um, 
an artist, Myra Kalman, who actually, in, in a lovely turn, contributed a couple of images to the book. And I don't think she'd be offended if I told you that I think she retains a kind of childlike ability to see the world. In other words, she's not, she entertains anything. She's not already deciding what's good to look at and what's not good to look at. And when you take that view, then a familiar block turns unfamiliar. Um, so I thought I would read a couple of snippets from a few of the walks, and um, I'll, I'll stop those before they get too tedious, and then answer any questions, of course, about dogs or otherwise. So the first one I want to tell you about is um, a walk with a woman named Arlene Gordon, who I met through um, Oliver Sacks, and she um, was... Um, became blind halfway through her life in her 40s um, and I wanted to see what she saw on a walk around the block. Um, there's a lot of history of or at least there's the idea that somebody who loses one modality, sensory modality like sight suddenly has this preternatural ability at, with all their other senses. That's somewhat true conceivably if you lose your sight or hearing or whatever when you're very young. But the brain isn't that plastic when you're older. Um, and she certainly professed to have no special sensory capacity at all. You know, she said, I don't know what you're gonna find out from what I see. And I didn't either, but I had some ideas and it, happily I was, I was wrong. And here's one of the things she showed me. <clears throat> we walked along. Gordon Street, a classic Upper West Side street in New York City. It housed various towering apartment buildings. One barely notices the differences among them from street level. The bottom floors are often lined with a similar limestone. Any characteristic brickwork, cornice, or grotesques on the building face needed distance to be appreciated. Along this stony monolith to our side, Gordon suddenly spoke up. Are we under an awning? We were not. Each of the buildings we were passing has an awning projecting over the sidewalk. It's in its shade that the building's residents can wait for a taxi when it rains or simply relax in the quasi-private transition from the city streets to home. But Gordon and I were not under an awning. We were, however, fast closing in on one. We're about two feet from it, I said, a little disappointed that she had gotten it wrong. A moment later, we moved under it. With the warmth of the sun blocked temporarily from grilling our skin, even I, sighted and unobservant, could notice the change. I sensed it, Gordon said with satisfaction. There was a big difference in the sound. Oh, oh, the sound. The clap of her tapping cane bounced off and hit the underside of the awning. Coming back at us, muted, clipped. I could suddenly feel the closeness of the awning overhead, the way it brought in the sounds of our footfalls. A doorman chatting with a tenant in a low tone was perfectly intelligible. This public space felt private, protected from the sounds of the city. Three short steps later, we were out from under the awning shading reach, and noises again flew away into the open air. I asked Gordon if she could tell we had emerged. She took another step. Now we're out. The awning Gordon perceived, I realized, was wider on either side than the awning I could see. The sound awning projected a good two or three feet more on both left and right. That was where the sound from her cane tap began to change. Gordon could see the awning. Hers was just a broader umbrella. This is how the cane does its canely magic. Gordon described to me what she was hearing of the landscape from its echo off her cane tap. She heard when an alleyway appeared between buildings lining our route. She heard the height of buildings and noticed when we had arrived in front of a school, quieted in summertime, set back more deeply from the street. Inside her building, she told me, she uses the sound of the floors that present themselves when the elevator doors open to identify whether she had arrived at the basement gym or the penthouse. In a carpeted room, she added, I'll sometimes get lost because I can't hear sounds. A tap on the carpet bounces exactly nowhere. In Gordon's case, using the cane has changed her brain. Beyond personal space, the space around it this, us that we discourage most other bodies from entering into, our brains are also alert to peripersonal space, the bubble of space outlined by and directly surrounding our bodies. This bubble extends to right about where our limbs can extend, so it's larger for people with longer arms, piano player fingers or legs up to there. Neuroscientists discovered cells in the brains of monkeys and humans that are specialized to fire to sounds, touch, and sights in this near space. 
even with normal fingers and limbs, if you have ever sensed someone sneaking up behind you as you sat engaged in a book or a meal, you were experiencing your own peripersonal space. For even the sneakiest of persons creates small noises of movement and breath, emits ample odor, warms the air, and with his body changes the way sounds bounce around your head. We can feel his presence. Wonderfully, our brain extends that bubble when we extend ourselves. Wear a top hat for a day and you will soon stop knocking it on low doorway lintels. After using chopsticks regularly, the brain begins to consider them extensions of your fingers. The brain of a baseball player experiences his bat as a continuation of his hands. The trumpeter's trumpet is an adjunct of herself. And a blind person experienced with using a cane has the athlete's and musician's skill with it. So maybe a bit about Charlie Eisman, the insect tracker. We walked in Springfield, um, Massachusetts, where I had lived in a previous life as when I was a lexicographer for Merriam-Webster years ago. It was not a city that I, f I thought was too promising in terms of types of things you could see on the street. Um, but we spent, you know, an hour and a half going a, maybe a third of a mile. Um, his great strategy for seeing, by the way, is um, flip things over. <laughs> That's where you notice the, I'm sorry to say, innumerable bugs around us. <laughs> the discovery of the day was not the downy woodpecker cruising up and down the hackberry in the corner of a vacant lot, leaving sign in the form of beak marks, itself sign of some tasty beetle under the bark. It was not the adorable pupa of a ladybug, sitting calmly square in the middle of a catalpa leaf, its head tucked under its body and its abdomen folded protectively. It was the sign on wood by a most unlikely creature. We had just found some slug slime on a birch leaf. There's a slug among us, Eisman said. I did not think of slugs as critters that might want to be on trees, but Eisman described to me how some slugs eat the film of algae on the bark of a tree, and in scraping their teeth against the bark, leave a series of kisses with jagged lips. The resultant mark shows up clearly on light-colored backgrounds like a birch tree or on a white propane tank or an abandoned car covered with weather and detritus. It's a feathery pattern, this back-and-forth S-shaped pattern he was saying before. Oh, here we go. On the broad trunk of a tree was a sinuous pattern of spiky footsteps, a series of stamps of a sharpened fern frond, slug teeth marks. Eisman looked entirely satisfied. I had always suspected it was slugs who were doing it, leaving this kind of track, but I couldn't figure out how because I didn't realize slugs had teeth. It took seeing a slug in action to confirm his suspicions. In truth, slugs do not really have teeth. They have radula, a finely toothed kind of tongue that only mollusks have. It allows them to graze, rasping their body against a surface to sop up whatever they're gliding over. Sign of slug. It was pretty, delicate even more so for being the unlikely result of a gelatinous, lumbering creature. We gazed admiringly at its path tattooed on the tree. I fumbled through my bag for a camera and snapped a photo of it, surely one of the only extant images of slug sign outside of Eisman's and other slug enthusiasts' collection. <laughs> I, love, I loved finding that. Um, a little of Sid Horenstein. the geologist on West 78th Street. A few buildings in from the avenue, we reached a knee-high retaining wall in front of a row house, a short, unlovely white wall separating the sidewalk from the building's trash storage. Horenstein stopped, to my surprise. Apart from a few bright yellow leaves on its surface, the wall was not something, was not something to attract me. It looked filthy. Not to Horenstein. To him, it looked like gold. Limestone. This is limestone from Indiana, right here. These are worm burrows. He fingered a long squiggle on the surface of the wall. It did look like a place that worm had been trapped. But in the rock? In the rock. This rock was once loose stuff, sediment, on the seafloor. And you have these sea worms going through it and leaving their trails. When the rock was soft sediment, ancient marine worms burrowed through it, eating their way along. The worm-shaped traces Hornstein was pointing out were their paths chemically changed from passing through the worm's digestive system and fossilized after the worm moved on. 
On the very next building down the street, he found some of the sea worm's old pals. Oh, and here's a crinoid, and that's a bryozoan, bryozoan, pardon my not knowing the names of these little sea creatures, and that's actually a pelecipod right there. These were not familiar animal characters to me, but as I started to parse the variegated surface for signs of past life, Hornstein explained what we were seeing. Limestone, a popular building material, is hugely popular in DC, if you haven't, didn't know that already, is full of the shells, remains, and other traces of ancient animals. In fact, it mostly is those fossils and fragments. <coughs> Like schist, it's formed in the geologically long ago era on the floor of the oceans, and this ocean was where the Midwestern U.S. is now. The movement of ocean waters broke up the shells of the small invertebrate animals, snails, scallops, other tiny or organisms. Crinoids were little creatures with stems of repeated disks stacked like wafers. Bryozoans were sedentary animals shaped like fans, much like coral. Pelicipods, scallopy things, left a trace of the familiar seashell by the seashore. The crinoid wafers look like small coins with O's in their center, ancient subway tokens for the sea. Suddenly I saw them everywhere. The worm traces read like ancient graffiti down the length of the building. Taking this in, my view of the street was entirely changed. No longer was it passive rock, it was a sea graveyard. That's a surprising thing to see on this retaining wall, 300 million year old worm tracks I managed. As though Horenstein could make this fact illogical and ordinary, he did not attempt a response. Um, okay, and finally, I'll just end with a short bit about, about a dog, since that's what got me into this. So I walked with my dog um, and just let him take the walk. It's actually very hard to do for a dog who's been with you for a while. You walk out the door and you say, okay, and they are waiting for you to lead them. So it was a really interesting exercise to, to entirely let him lead me from the moment that you walk out, um, he was reluctant. But then, of course, as with a child, you, you know, they'll go, but they just don't do a walk that is the way you define a walk, right? Which is sort of like getting from A to B and going in more or less a linear course and not slowing down. It's all about slowing down and taking diversionary paths. Um, he had something else in mind. Suddenly, after a long, slow ramble, he was pulling me, his nose in urgent pursuit. We wound up at the stairs outside a short apartment building. Every week, I watch Spellbound as his nose leads him on a wending course to locate the handful of well-slobbered tennis balls that have been waiting in a field of ivy since we last visited the week prior. But this time, his nose seemed to have led him astray. There was no ball. There was nothing. Only a still closed door in our face. Three minutes later, we were still standing on the stairs to greet a woman I recognized from morning dog walks as she led her charge out for a bit of midday relief. She had, she explained, just returned home. I goggled a bit and tried to explain our, to her our presence on her stoop while Finn happily wiggled. Shortly, he was ready to move on, and it was I who wanted to loiter and think about how she, he knew where she lived. I should not have been at all surprised. Buildings do not typically wear prominent evidence of their tenants, but each person leaves tracks individual odors in our footprints, even in the smells that radiate from us in, in the air we move through. Catch an elevator just after it's dropped off a perfumed rider or a smoker and you see what I mean. The evidence of her presence still hangs in the air. Whether trained in tracking or not, dogs can detect our individual odors and even the direction in which we've gone. Each step we leave has over time a slightly different quantity of odor than the one before and after it. The newest step is the smelliest, the oldest is the least smelly. For tracking dogs, five steps is plenty to determine direction through this change in, of odor concentration. Finn saw this woman's recent return through her steps. The city block for him was covered with evidence of familiar and unfamiliar people and dogs passing by. Each time I step out of my door, I see more or less the same block. No wonder Finn stops when we exit. It's a wholly new street wearing odors of the six hours since we were last outside waiting to be sniffed in for him. All right. I'm happy to attempt to answer any questions about your dog or about anything else. <laughs> or walking. Um. 
I must say I find this to be a very interesting, uh, not being an American myself, coming from the Caribbean, I find this to be a very interesting um, subject matter. Because um, I, I want to ask, um, the, the people you had walking with you, what do you have one background, a diverse background? A. And I, I'm asking this question because um, it seems to me, you know, if you come from Africa, the Caribbean, or Latin America, Central America, Asia, uh, you walk with American, right? My own experience is that you do see things differently than they do. Uh, maybe gender also has aspects of this, right? I mean, a woman walks down yes. the street different to a man. Um, maybe the time of moving from rural areas, right? Uh, Max Weber notion of organic and mechanical solidarity, right? Um, education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I was wondering, uh, have you thought about maybe doing something like this with a wider array of people mm. to try to see what they would see on the same type of walk? And uh, uh, or maybe you have done it or maybe you've read about it already mm. and want to talk about it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, well, I think you're right. I mean, the thing that I realized after just having a few walks was that although I was picking people who had usually knowledge that changed their perception, but often were constitutionally different, right, in age or in gender or in sensory ability, I thought I could really choose anybody, you know, as long as you could. The only real requirement was that they were comfortable with and kind of able to talk about what they saw, which is not trivially easy because you have to yourself understand the difference between your perception or have an inkling of the difference between your perception and someone else to even make explicit the things which are ordinary for you. But certainly different races, different ages, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic situations, different professions, you know, but even two people growing up in the same house with different interests would be sufficient to, to see a divergence. So I haven't done all those walks. You know, I did do a few dozen walks for this book, and there are only 11 represented in here because at some point um, I realized it was an infinite exercise. But I, I think you're right. Yeah. I just wanted to, I've, any number of things I'd like to share with you from what you've been saying, but I'll pick one. Um, when I was much younger and I lived right over there, our family had a friend who was a much older guy who was an anatomy professor from St. Andrews, and he lived here for a year. He told me a story about his observations when he was a young uh, student, that between classes he would go out to the ruins of an old cloister, and he observed that the sun would warm the stone, burn off the dew, and he would sit there, and the sunlight would come over his shoulder and there would be no glare. He observed these things very carefully, and later I visited him, and he had designed a house around that orientation. It was, a, it was a lovely place. It was a student of Arthur Conan Doyle's. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. Well, I mean, even that just, it, it's interesting to me that just that one observation could have such repercussions for him. But I'm sure there were plenty he didn't tell you about. And in fact, an anatomist, I mean, that's, sure. oh, th I mean, that would be so exciting if, if they could make explicit what they see. I... I almost, for, after I walked with the doctor, I almost couldn't look at people on the street. <laughs> and it's not that I had the expertise then. I didn't. I just, I just suddenly had a glimpse at the numbers of things that were revealed. So I didn't know, you know, I knew some of the names of the types of disorderly gates, for instance, that people then have, as they call them politely. Because I myself at the time had a disorderly gate, so I got kind of interested in disorderly gates. But I didn't know the names of all of them, but I realized you could see radiated up through someone's step, you know, what has happened anatomically for them, and therefore probably also functionally for them. And it's profound. So um, I hope you got more from him, too. I did. And <laughs> just so you know, I'm an architecture professor, and I'm buying those for my students. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. Uh, can you select a, a walk uh, whereby um, you were walking with your partner, whoever that happened to be, and uh, dealing with the sense of hearing, mm -hmm. uh, and it struck you in a, in a captivating and enchanting way, the way this person heard these various things that you never heard in your life, and you suddenly heard what his information to you. 
Well, I did do a walk with a sound engineer, um, which was a kind of wonderful. I mean, I also walking with Arlene and attending to her auditory perception got me more interested in in, in thinking about sounds, because especially in the city, um, especially in New York City, sounds are just offensive. You know, they're uh, oppressive. And in fact, the year I was working on this, two books came out about trying to find a place of total silence, um, which I find kind of tragic, actually. And uh, because just as when I hear people say, oh, I could lose my sense of smell, no big deal. I think, oh, actually, you know, there's a huge amount of information there. And instead of moving away from it, I wanted to turn toward it and try to re imagine these sounds. So walking with a Scott, um, Scott Lair, who was a sound engineer, we listened to some sounds I'd heard before and just tried to not put an, an evaluation on them, which is, it takes a bit of effort. But then it's just information, just as smells for a dog that are grotesque to us are just information to the dog. Um, he was, at the beginning of our walk, walking through the Mets because he designs sounds for um, movies. And there was one movie that had a scene in an open area of a museum and they didn't have the sound for it. And they needed a little snippet of sound that sounded like people walking through an open area in a museum. Um, and so we were going from room to room just listening to the ambient sound until he found one that kind of matched the space that was in the, um, in the museum. And that was very illuminating to also realize that every room has a sound. So consider that. There, the way that my voice or your voice or just the sounds of people moving through this bookstore sounds, we are accustomed to. If it sounded like a bathroom sound, not the flushing of toilets, but the type of echoing that you hear in the bathroom, it would be disturbing to us. So to then just pause and realize the, the, our recognition of the sound of a bookstore is, to me, pleasurable. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, it seems like um, I don't. I don't mean this critically, but it's the kind of the basis of the question. You, and you said it yourself that at least some, maybe most of the, of your um, companions on these walks had a particular profession or some body of knowledge that mm. they brought to bear on the on what they saw and what they told you about. It seems like um, in many of those cases, maybe most of them, they it was clear to both of you that's why they were invited and so that they were sort of challenged to uh, yes. perhaps to find things yeah. uh, that would kind of um, pr you know would uh, demonstrate their perception uh, demonstrate their perceptions sure. yeah um, how do you suppose you hadn't approached the selection process in quite the same way and had just done a more random sample of Mm. human beings or whatever and didn't say anything didn't give them any direction or hints as to what sorts of things you wanted them to uh, identify or find interesting or to tell you about or whatever if it, it really began much more with a blank slate right do you think the results w and and you did a few dozen or maybe even a hundred of these just hypothetically how how do you think the results would have shown out? Would, you, would there have been a lot of sameness in what people uh, saw, or would there be? Yeah, that'd uh, be just like walking with the people you ordinarily walk with, yeah, right? We right. don't tell each other things we see. And, I mean, I didn't tell them what to see. Uh -huh. I oh. I told at all because I didn't know what they would see. Right. right. Um, that's the premise. But I did happily stack the deck. I mean, I was dealing with a verbal population for right, once, right. like tell me what you see right. but that's all I said and they knew oh I'm a geologist so I will tell you what I see that has to do with geology but that was the extent of my instruction and right. if I didn't even tell them that then it's just walking with a person and what they tend to reveal to you walking together which right. if they're verbose maybe a lot but right. if they're more socially <laughs> appropriate might not be that much <laughs> so I I um and I but I kind of don't think that the thing that I could have done to get more out of them, actually, is pick people who were really good at talking about what they knew. I mean, there are plenty of people who do tours. Now, they might not be seeing new things anymore, right? Because they'll, just like everybody else, get 
provincial about what they see on the place that they're demonstrating what there is to see. Right. But certainly they would see a lot in that space. And these people were not people who were experienced, except I think but one, at talking really about what they knew. Right. They might have been writers. Some of them weren't writers. Some of them weren't experts in any way. Um, so if I had, I could have stacked the deck even more and actually found people who, who know how to tell you what's on the street, right? right. But so ap apparently that's not a big skill. Um, maybe that will change. But uh, so I think, but I do think you could, uh, you know, walk with anybody and get something out of them. But you have to tell them. I need to see what, you know, you need to tell me what you can see. I don't right. know what it's going to be. But what are you looking at? Right, right. And just be, be out loud. It seemed like one of the one of your purposes in writing the book was to get people, was to encourage people to uh, uh, see more broadly or to uh, do. And yet, a lot of these examples, uh, a lot of the, the people that you described and read about to us just then were people who had, were aware of things that an ordinary person probably wouldn't be able to even if they followed oh no followed you can hear the sound uh, of the awning hmm? you can hear the awning yeah okay. you know you can see the slug marks you have to know to go to the tree and That's look right. for something you have okay. to know to listen instead of just looking when you're walking down the street you have to know i mean i can't smell like my dog that's the right. one thing i can't do <laughs> but those the almost all i might not know the name of the slug marks but i'd know that that's an insect mm. sign and I might not know why or understand why I can hear that sound, why I can hear the awning or what's going on, but if I'm aware of it, um, I can notice it. These are all things anyone could notice. Okay, good, thanks. Hello. Hi. My dog, Ruben, is a Border Collie mix. He loves to chase anything that moves. The only thing he's ever caught is a young fox. <laughs> but we wow. freed him from, I wonder, um, if there's a place where they can be trained, I've heard that they've been used on beaches to chase away the gulls who befoul the beach and golf courses too. Yeah. I think my dog has the instinct he needs, but I don't know the, how to handle it. <laughs> Do you know if there's a place? There are goose, uh, and border collies are great at, um, there are goose patrol, patrolling dogs, actually. Right. And they just kind of harass the geese. <laughs> And then the geese move away from that place and onto someplace else. And I mean, as with that, um, is there another? I mean, of course, you know, sheep. If you could find some yeah. sheep, yeah. <laughs> that would be excellent. Or a preschool which needs <laughs> to corral the children. Right. <laughs> Other than that, it's more like just find another type of outlet for that energy, even if it's not specifically about what their instinct is to do. I do want to say too of just thinking about this idea of like you know what what did I write the book for you know was it to tell everybody to see and I, I sometimes I think I risk coming across as like um, kind of a scold like you have to notice everything you can't just walk down the street I always am just walking down the street I don't always look and even people who are actually quite good at this don't always see so there's no but it seems to me and actually, I have a story about that that I mention in this book, that one of the very first people I, I walked with was a professor of psychology um, who studies attention. And in fact, her focus is mindfulness. And I thought, fantastic. I, mean, I was so excited when she wanted to walk with me. And so we walked, actually we took a walk in her neighborhood with her dogs. And at some point, she wound up a few steps ahead of me on the walk. And we were talking about what she saw. and. Um, and I was just a bit behind her, and I noticed on the ground that she had just stepped over a $20 bill. <laughs> and then we saw, I saw another one right next to it, and then a third. And I thought, no matter how successful a professor of psychology of attention you are, <laughs> you notice $60 lying on the ground, right? <laughs> and I pointed this out to her, and she was entirely unmoved by it. She said, well, you can't see everything all the time. <laughs> And she said, now you're going to buy me lunch, which is a very politic way of rebuffing my criticism. Anyway, but I think, you know, I, what I appreciate about having done this was that there is always something more to see, right? It, there, 
anytime I'm walking down this, a fam especially a familiar place, and I just want to turn my attention to kind of one type of thing. Look at the trees. Look at people's pants heights. Look at, look at the shadows. It becomes suddenly a rich, engaging walk. Whereas before I was distracted by my phone or only thought there was something interesting if I, it was on a handheld device or was just potentially bored by walking down the street. Now I felt like I have this sort of attentional muscle I could flex. And I, um, I guess I hope that for others as well. Thank you.